Okay. There you go, recording in progress. Okay, thanks everybody. And um, thanks a lot for the invitation. And uh, you can see my slide, is it working correctly? Yeah, great. Yeah. Um, all right, so thank you for the introduction and um, thanks for the invitation. And uh, I'm excited to be here talking about this with you all. It really came at a good time for me actually. Um, ben White and I have just uh, put out um, a bit of this research in a new Aeon article called The Warped Self. It just dropped uh, last week. So if you're interested in this talk, check out the article. And again, this was written with Ben White, who's here with me this evening. So although I'm going to leave just after this because it's one o'clock in the morning, Ben's going to stick around. So if you have any questions, you can ask him. Um, right. So let's get started here. So this is uh, Levi Jed Murphy, if you don't know him. Um, he's an influencer in the UK. And he self-reports that he spent around 30,000 pounds on cosmetic surgery, um, specifically so that he could increase his social media status. Um, he tells lots of people, he's pretty, um, he's pretty forward about this, that uh, when he posts a picture, if it doesn't get enough likes in a certain amount of time, then he trashes the picture. And um, his surgeries are really a way for him to achieve that expected validation. And uh, we think that Murphy's story helps to highlight some of the growing concerns that people are having about the potential harmful side effects of social media. And that's what our article is on. And it's what our full length paper that's actually been written with um, Andy Clark shortly uh, will also be on. So so-called Snapchat dysmorphia and Snapchat surgery are relatively new concepts, but I guess you can figure out what they are um, even if you've never encountered them before, right? So this is the tendency that some social media platforms have to produce pathologies of self-image. And that includes creating obsessive negative rumination over parts of our body and um, potentially fueling cosmetic surgery as a solution to, that, um, to those sorts of pathologies. So a recent study found that nearly 50% of the young people that were surveyed felt that social media had influenced them, had, um, uh, had uh, made them feel like maybe they would like to get cosmetic surgery. 50% of the young people in this survey said that they felt that social media had fueled in them a desire to look into cosmetic surgery. And another survey found that 50% of plastic surgeons today are now having patients show up with their filtered images in hand asking to be made to look like their icons that they make of themselves. And I, I don't know if you know this, but until um, relatively recently, Instagram even had an app where you could preview what cosmetic surgery would look like. Um, it's been taken down now, but of course there's other apps that are like this. So although there are concerns growing today about social media and cosmetic surgery, and those concerns are relatively new, um, these are really just the new kids on the block when it comes to people thinking that there's a relationship between social media and possible problems with mental health. So I think you probably are all well aware that there is a growing, there is growing evidence that's linking social media use with lots of um, mental health issues, including anxiety and depression and addiction. And, um, Nevertheless, although there, you know, this is becoming much more a part of our um, cultural story, um, we don't really know so much about the cognitive mechanisms underlying these various pathologies. And that's a bit of a problem because it, it, it prevents us from knowing uh, what is the issue and if there is an issue. And of course, we don't really know how to solve it because we're not really sure what the problem is. So our project has been to see whether or not some new advances in computational neuroscience might be able to shed some light on this, and we think they do. And actually, we think it provides quite an elegant account, not just of some of the things like Snapchat surgery and uh, Snapchat dysmorphia, but also addiction, depression, and anxiety. We think the same framework helps us get a grip on why all of those might come out. Okay, so um, anybody here already familiar with predictive processing or active inference? Show of hands. Yeah, you guys already know. Yeah, okay, well, we've got at least one so-so. So I'll give, you a, I'll give you a quick crash course so that you can follow along with what I think is the, the cool part of looking at these things through that. So if you're not familiar, according to this framework, um, the brain can be imagined as a prediction engine. And that is an engine that's dedicated to figuring out what happens next 
and to minimizing the discrepancies or what we say um, prediction errors between what the brain expects the world to be like and the way the world actually turns out to be. And it turns out that a system that makes predictions and reduces the prediction error relative to discrepancies is a super good way to get a system to learn a lot about its environment. And it's a great way to get a system to be highly adaptive in a changing and volatile environment. And um, so it's no wonder you know, that we're starting to build artificial intelligences in just that way. So the big thing to notice here, this is the big sort of reveal, is that this approach to cognitive processing more or less flips the tradition on its head. So traditionally, we thought that the brain was largely a passive organ. So it would wait around for sensory signals to come in, and then it would process those signals from simple up through to complex. And um, again, this is a really a, a, almost a complete inversion of that. So the brain here and the wider system um, is radically proactive. So rather than waiting around for signals from the world, it's all the time using what it already knows about the world to construct for itself from the top down. So this is no longer a purely bottom up story, which it was traditionally um, produced for itself from the top down, the sensory signals it's about to encounter in the world. And uh, okay, so to succeed at that, for a system like that to succeed, then it needs to build up what's called the generative model. That is the model that generates the predictions. Okay, and a generative model is basically, it's a structured understanding of the statistical regularities that underwrite or govern our environment. So that is just to say, we need to build up a model over time of how things evolve in the world. And we use that model in order to figure out if some bit of data is some particular thing in a particular context, like a cute fluffy kitten. Um, so our sort of predictive system, if it has error in the system, it can reduce that error and that's its primary role here, okay? So the modus operandi of this system is to reduce prediction error relative to its predictions. And um, for us, there's two ways that we can reduce prediction error. We can either update the generative model to better fit the world, okay? Or we can act on the world to make the world better align with the predictions that we already have. So for instance, if the temperature drops, that is uh, a prediction error for our kind of organism because we expect to be at a certain temperature, right? So if the, if the temperature drops, there's error in the system. So how does the system deal with that? Well, one, you could just learn to accept the change. So in a way, this is like updating your model, like the Iceman Wim Hof, right? He's stretched his ability to manage the error that comes from being cold. Or we could act on the world. We just grab a blanket. Um, in either case, you, as an embodied prediction machine, are always trying to get from uncertainty to certainty. And by reducing, um, by reducing all the potentially harmful surprises that you encounter in your life day to day, you keep yourself alive and well. How is that? Is that okay for a crash course? Does everybody feel, mo yeah, good, right, okay. So over the past few years, um, I've been working in one particular niche here, thinking about um, a new idea about how changes in the rate at which we minimize prediction errors um, actually manifest as bodily affect. So I mean to say, simply put, when we do better than expected at reducing prediction error, we feel good. And when we do worse than expected at reducing prediction error, we feel bad. And those feelings turn out to play a really central role in tuning how the system predicts and behaves as it goes forward in the world. So the only thing that's really important here, the take home message is that we literally feel, we feel our way to optimization. And you can see here, I don't know if you, can you see my um, mouse on the screen? Yeah, okay, so this is a, this is, um, a graph from Geoffrey and Coricelli's excellent paper. So if you're interested, you should definitely check this out. You can see right here, as prediction error goes up, we have feelings of fear, when prediction error is high and pervasive, we have feelings of hopelessness. When it starts coming down again, we have feelings of joy or hopefulness. Uh, sorry, lack of hopefulness, the other one, hopefulness here. And then again, when it's low prediction error, then we feel happy. And uh, if you want a more technical account, check out um, Casper Hesp et al's 2019 paper. If you're into that, um, you can find the how they actually look at this in uh, in a more formal expression. 
Okay, so the point here is that we are hardwired as prediction organisms to seek out better than expected opportunities to reduce error. It makes us feel good, we get rewarded by it, so we're all the time looking for ways to reduce error better. And that's part of the reason why we wouldn't be satisfied just getting into a dark room. This is a big concern for a lot of people. If you're a predictive system that's always trying to reduce error, then why don't we just end up in a dark room? And the reason is, is because with too little error, you would be bored. With too much error, uh, it's too volatile. Both of those are kinds of suffering. We're always looking for the right amount of error, the right kind of error slope. Good, and uh, maybe just one last point. So this second order affective information, uh, yet that is um, information about how well or poorly we're predicting over time. Um, it keeps us then always searching and learning and growing in ways that ultimately, well, when everything is working right, um, lead us to a better or more optimal relationship with the environment. Oh, maybe as a little side, it's no wonder that jigsaw puzzles have been so popular in COVID because uh, it really is um, a nice way to see our love of manageable uncertainty, right? We don't know exactly how it works. Um, so there's a bunch of uncertainty, but it's really manageable uncertainty, which is um, really attractive to us when we have too much volatility. Okay, so we think that this particular feature of the predictive system is the one that gets hijacked by social media. Okay, so let's talk about that. So living well as a predictive system, if you followed me so, long, so far, living well as a predictive system means that we are able to effectively manage prediction error over a lifetime, okay? And to be successful at reducing error or managing error over a lifetime is predicated on us having a generative model that accurately or at least usefully um, tracks the real world, okay? So a generative model that poorly reflects the regularities in our environment, of course, will generate bad predictions. And if we're generating bad predictions, then we are going to have difficult to resolve errors coming up. Like, for instance, if you believe the Earth is flat, you know, it's kind of crazy that people really actually believe that nowadays, okay? So let's say you have that belief, you've got a belief installed that the world is flat. Just think about how hard that's going to be for you because all the counter evidence, and there's like loads of counter evidence, right, that the world isn't flat, all of that counter evidence is now going to be error in the system that's asking to be resolved. And how do we manage that error? Well, you could install further beliefs that help you uh, deal with that error, like there's a big conspiracy out there and everyone's just lying to you. Or you can act on the world by you know, spending more time in the kind of echo chambers where you have other people saying, yeah, the world is flat. Notice here that there's a kind of nasty feedback cycle, and this is really natural in the, in the predictive processing framework. So optimizing machines like us can be suboptimal quick if we install bad beliefs, especially bad beliefs that get fixed in some way. Um, we'll come back to that in a second because I think that's what social media is doing for us. So uh, for a system that has a belief installed that isn't a good belief, it's not an optimal belief, and it gets stuck, then um, it ends up creating this self-fulfilling prophecy where the system starts now changing its own beliefs and changing the world in order to um, bring about the thing that it believes. Okay, so here's one big danger with social media, right? It turns out that social media is a kind of spectacularly effective method for warping our generative model. And I think we all know that. But what I like about this is it gives us a little bit of scientific um, foundation for understanding why that might be so dangerous, right? So just think with a few swipes of your finger, you can dramatically alter your appearance or you can take the same picture over and over and over again and then pass it off like it's real life. Right? And the result is that we have these sort of powerful, bad evidence generators in our life that we're spending increasing time with. And they mislead us about what the world is actually right, like, right? They tell us that everyone is beautiful and happy and perfect and leisurely. And um, I love this post from Scarlett London saying, uh, let me share with you a little insight about how I start my day in a positive way. And uh, this guy, Nathan, responds, fuck off. This is anybody's normal morning. Uh, Instagram is a ridiculous lie factory made to make us feel all inadequate. And that's uh, exactly our point here. So in a sense, social media can be thought of as a kind of digital crowbar, right? It uh, pries apart 
our generative model, which is so important for our optimizing function um, from our offline experiences, from our offline world. And um, over time, the real danger is that our offline expectations, they start being uh, infected and uh, influenced by our online expectations. So for example, if you become accustomed to your own doctored appearance, and more importantly, to the kind of ongoing social feedback that you're getting that's associated with that false appearance, then the lower level validation that is available in offline encounters and relative to your real appearance, they start registering as uh, mounting prediction error, right? You get used to a certain level of validation and then your ordinary life starts being filled with error. Um, the result then would be this constant stream of negatively balanced feelings of stress and inadequacy every time we encounter our real self or our real world. And I think we can agree that that's a big problem. Okay, a couple of moves here now. What happens if these errors persist? Okay, so now we've got a bad evidence generator that's creating bad predictions and creating persistent error. What happens if that error just keeps going? What if we don't correct? Okay. Well, first we have finite resources. So persistent error will eventually overwhelm the system and produce all the kind of harmful cascading health problems that we see associated with various health conditions. So like HPA access dysregulation occurs in the same ways it would occur in depression. Um, and second, and a bit more vicious, your system may come to predict the failure to resolve errors. Okay, so that is that um, predictive systems can learn at a higher level that the world is just the sort of place where you can't get a good predictive grip. And once that belief is installed, that belief that you just can't, you can't do well in the world, you know, the world is just filled with errors, then the system does what it always does. And that is it starts sampling the world in order to prove its expectation, which means you start really paying attention to situations where you have evidence that you can't succeed in the world. Um, in a number of papers, and I've listed them here on the side because this is a pretty quick talk, but if you wanna check it out, here's some more of our research. Um, we've suggested that this critical loss coming from a persistent kind of error um, underlies the feelings of helplessness and the lack of motivation and our inability to feel pleasure that are associated with depression. And uh, it possibly underwrites depersonalization and dissociative disorders as well. Okay, so to be clear, these harmful effects arise when there's a stuck belief, right? A belief that's not being updated for one reason or another. And it's a bad belief, a belief that's not optimal in some important way. And um, we think that lots of engagement with warping effects from social media is exactly the kind of thing that might install this kind of belief and then get it to be sticky in just this sort of way. Um, Notice also that from this perspective, extreme actions like Snapchat surgery start making sense because you've got a, you've got a warped model now and you've got, you've got pervasive persistent error. And if that error just keeps pinging, then there's the potential to flip over into things like depression and anxiety disorders. So how do you get rid of that error? Well, actually in some sense, cosmetic surgery is just like grabbing the blanket for this kind of system right? You're just acting on the world in a way that helps bring the world, and in this case, your own body, into better alignment with your beliefs. The problem is, is that your expectations here have been, they've been bent out of shape by overexposure to bad evidence generators like social media. Okay, I think probably some of you will have been thinking by now, yeah, but like there's an easier thing to do, right? Just stop going on social media. But actually that turns out to be a lot more difficult than we think. Um, recent study shows that about 10% of social media users, so that's a lot, exhibit uh, addictive symptoms. Um, that's about the same number as people who get addicted to alcohol actually. Um, and uh, just as a side point, and we'll bring it back to social media in a second, in this excellent book, Your Brain on Porn, um, Gary Wilson, suggests that internet porn is so addictive because it's a, a hyper stimulator. And uh, we like this concept. So just consider in one evening uh, on the internet, you can get levels of sexual novelty that would have been impossible for your ancestors over their whole lifetime, 
right? Just in a single night. And I want you to think about how alluring that would be and indeed dangerous for predictive organisms like us that are always trying to find new ways of doing better than expected at reducing error, okay? Multiple tabs, hundreds of models, escalating fetishes, they all tell the system that it's doing tremendously better than expected at this basic drive for procreation, right? So reward circuitry goes crazy, it enforces behaviors, and there's your addiction. And meanwhile, in reality, like let's be super clear, right? Meanwhile, in reality, you're sitting by yourself at home, you know? So there again is that digital crowbar prying apart reality from the fictional reality that you're engaging with. So what pornography is to sex, we think social media is to our intrinsic appetite for socializing. Um, now, like pornography, social media, uh, in part by dissolving these temporal and spatial restraints that ordinarily govern offline interactions, okay, allows for this massive amount of novelty and validation to be possible, right? Uh, users can exchange messages with a huge number of people, even complete strangers. And when you get bored or you fall behind your expectations for social validation, what do you do? Well, just with a quick swipe, you can generate all sorts of new, exciting, unpredictable encounters in ways we've never been able to do in the past. Um, now, add to that the curated fantasy point that we've already been talking about, right, for both porn and social media. So for predictive systems always looking for better than real life scenarios, better than expected scenarios. Think about how powerful, how alluring social media can be showing these better than real life examples. And actually there's some evidence now that even if you know that an image is doctored, it's still alluring. It's still powerfully magnetizing for us. And that's because all parts, all sorts of the subsystems in us, um, they don't take notice of agent level understanding. So it doesn't matter really what you know, the system is still gonna be magnetized to those better than real world examples. And uh, finally, keep in mind, and now here's the sort of the worst part of the research I've been doing, that social media designers, they know about this, right? They know about this connection between alluring uncertainty and reward processing. And uh, they, use that, they use that knowledge in all sorts of ways to optimally attract predictive organisms just like us. Okay, last slide. So again, the real danger here is that over time, we come to expect uh, these incredible, in fact, too good to be true slopes of error reduction. And um, the massive, you know, the massive social validation and highly curated imagery and engineers building optimally uncertain generators, that all works to make our offline world increasingly unsatisfying. That's the danger, is that it warps our generative model such that when we get offline, we feel alienated by the world. And so the result is that your ordinary human life and your ordinary experiences of yourself, they begin to fill up with errors. And then how do we go about resolving those errors? We either get back online so that we can get back to the level of validation that we've now become accustomed to, or we go about the absurd project of uh, trying to make our offline world and offline self cohere with this completely warped online experience. And that's it. I hope that was close to 15 minutes. I might've gone a little bit over. Um, if you wanna get in touch, here's our information. Um, we will be uh, sharing around the paper as soon as it comes out. And uh, we're always up for collaborations and discussions. So really um, reach out if it's interesting and this is uh, an interest for your research as well. Yeah, thank you so much for the talk. I think it was very interesting.